Hi, I'm Jerry, and I'm an educational ambassador with Pacific Wildlife Care. And I'd like you to meet our long-eared owl. His name is Oberon. Some people, when they see these, think that they're baby great horned owls. However, a great horned owl would be two to three times larger than this. So he's quite a bit smaller than the great horned owl, although he is a horned owl. Um, and they say that these horns uh, are, they're also called ears, but they are not ears at all. They are, uh, we, we like to call them mood indicators because if they lie flat, he's not happy. Right now, he looks pretty happy. So um, it's also to identify in the field, other owls can see them. So he might attract a female or he could defend his territory by making sure some other owl knows that he's there. The, the other thing difference about them and a great horned owl is that they have a uh, different barring on their chest and they don't have the white throat patch that is very distinctive to a great horned owl, especially when they hoot. Um, a long-eared owl prefers woodland areas to roost and he leaves his roost and goes into open areas to hunt. So he would soar over grasslands or fields to hunt and he primarily eats uh, small rodents such as mice. And the other unique thing about him, however, is he can actually hover for brief periods of time. So he could, for instance, be on, at a light fixture trying to get a little uh, moth for dinner. So they have a more varied diet, which means they have more opportunities uh, for food in the wild. And uh, that might be why we don't see them very often. Another really unique feature about the long-eared owl is they will roost in groups. Most uh, owls and raptors in general get together for mating purposes. They have their babies and then they go their separate ways. However, they do mate for life, so they'll get back together again when it's time to have more babies. But these guys actually can colonize and they stay together. It might be because they're so small and safety in numbers and all that but uh, that's very unique to them. You see, he is uh, panting a little bit and it is pretty warm out here today. He's not necessarily stressed. It's just a little warm. And I can tell because his ears are a little back. So he's slightly unhappy by the heat here. Um, the, um, the other wonderful thing about these guys is that they uh, have many of the same attributes that you're going to hear about some other owls we have. They have the feathered feet, if you can see that. That helps protect their feet if they're catching a mouse that maybe were, would fight back. Uh, the other thing is that they are completely silent flyers like some of the other owls. Uh, their feathers are very soft and the leading edge of their flight feathers is slightly separated so that as the air flows through they fly very, very silently. Unique to the long-eared owl, however, is this white cross across his uh, beak on his face. Again, that indicates, uh, you can see that pretty well at night, so other owls can see that. And he also has these little whiskers, which help him if he's hunting for little grubs and things on the ground. Um, again, he'd prefer to have a mouse for dinner, but he'll try other opportunities if he needs to. I don't know if you can see his eyes super well, but he has gorgeous eyelashes on his eyelids that are just like ours. He has something else going on though. He has a nictating membrane, which is a second eyelid, which is clear. That does moisten his eye, uh, but it also is protective for him. So when he goes to strike, a lot of times he will slide that over his eye for protection, again, in case a little mouse would scratch him. Um, an injury like that in the wild could be a death sentence if it were to get infected, it could blind him. And so they have these wonderful built-in features to not only hope, uh, help them rather hunt successfully, but also protect them from, from predators. He has excellent, excellent night vision, and he is truly one of the top nocturnal owls out there other than the sawwet owl. So he um, has the yellow eyes, so if he can see while it's light out, this is not uncomfortable for him at all, but uh, he is, his main uh, vision uh, excels at night. Uh, what else about him? Aside from the fact he's super cute, let me tell you how we got him. Uh, 
he came from the California Valley and he was on the ground. His two other siblings, um, unfortunately, did not survive the fall. We assumed that it was either a um, great horned owl or other predator at the nest. Um, and what they'll do is, they'll, if the babies are at a certain age, they'll throw them out and go for the eggs. Could have been a COVID, corvid, it could have been a um, great horned owl, and it could have been a, a strong wind that would knock them out of their nest. He survived, however, you can tell just by appearance that the wing closest to me is not right. He actually fractured both of his wings. Uh, their bones heal very, very quickly. And uh, although he got excellent care, including a little physical therapy, which he did not care for, uh, the wings just healed in such a way that he can only fly about as high as my shoulder. So this would be a death sentence in the wild, so he cannot be released. Um, so he will be with us hopefully quite some time. I've had him, all of our um, educational ambassadors are non-releasable birds, and I've had him about five years now. We, they do look very similar between the male and female. The females might be a little bit larger, but it's hard to tell. So we DNA tested him, and Oberon is a young man. So I hope you enjoyed meeting him today. Thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate it. Hi, everybody. My name is Virginia Flaherty, and I'm a member of Pacific Wildlife Care's educational program. And this is Misty. Misty is a western screech owl, and she is actually one of the most common owls that we have here in San Luis Obispo County, even though most people have never seen a western screech owl. Um, and that's primarily because their size, you can see she's very, very small, and also because they have amazing camouflage and they're out at nighttime. So if you happen to come across a tree and um, you look up into it and you think you see something tiny moving around up there, but you're not really sure, it may be a little western screech owl. These guys love riparian areas, wooded areas, um, places where there are streams and so forth. Um, Misty, she came to us from Cayucas. She was hit by a car one night in Cayucas and, and her, the rescuer found her in the middle of the road and brought her into us. And you can kind of tell by looking at her, she's got eye issues. So when she was hit by the car, it actually, it, it uh, ruptured the lens on her right eye. And it also, um, it, it made, she's blind actually in both eyes. So she's got a detached retina in both eyes. So she is completely blind. And so obviously non-releasable because of that. Misty is one of the smallest owls that we have here in San Luis Obispo County. We have pygmy owls and saw wet owls. She's a slightly bigger than both of them. Um, but pretty small. She weighs about 180 grams, so that's a pretty tiny little owl. She's a female, so she is bigger than the males that we get in here. They weigh about 120, so they are really, really tiny. And Misty has a lot of features that Jerry was talking about with the long-eared owl that all owls have. She has silent flight, very, very soft feathers. Um, the leading edge of her wing feathers is, is serrated almost like a bread knife. So when the air passes through, it creates, it breaks up that airflow and it creates that silent flight. Um, she also has the feathering all the way down to her toes to protect her if she's grabbing something that may want to bite her. Um, she also has the bristles around the, the beak. They're really prominent on Misty. Um, I like to think of them as whiskers on a cat almost. So. Um, as Jerry mentioned, when she's looking for something on the ground, that helps her find something very easily. And they're very, very sensitive, those bristly whiskers right around her beak. Misty is also a horned owl, like the long-eared owl and the great horned owl. She has her, her ear tufts down right now, but you can kind of see them on the side of her head. And as Jerry mentioned, they really are mood indicators. So as soon as she's outside of her comfort zone, she puts them down. She's not really sure what's going on here. Um, Misty is also has, you can see on her face, she has that facial disc that you could really prominently see on the long-eared owl. And the, the feathers around that facial disc are also very stiff. And it's, it's easy to think of as like a satellite dish that's receiving sound. So within that facial disc on either side of her head, she has holes in the side of her head and those are her ears. One of them is a little higher and face forward. The other one is a little lower and facing backwards. So she actually has depth perception with her hearing. And 
Owls are amazing birds with hearing. They have incredible eyesight, but their hearing is so extraordinary. They do most of their hunting just using their hearing. Uh, they find something by listening to it, hearing a mouse or something scurrying through grass or through the leaves, and then they zero in on it with their eyes and they swoop down silently and grab it. So Misty has a little bit of a varied diet. She eats small rodents, but she'll also eat lizards and, and small snakes and things like that that are out in the evening, but also bugs. Um, one of her favorites is potato bugs, which um, would not be my favorite, but she loves them. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you about Misty here? Um, come on in, Jerry, why don't, or <laughs> Kathy, why don't we compare these two? Hi, I'm Kathy Duncan. I'm one of the education team, and this is Max, and he's a great horned owl. And talking about ear tufts, Max was head injured. He came to us hit by a car, blind and head injured. His tufts are always like this. He just, whether he's in his enclosure or what, he's just kind of droopy. Um, a lot of times we will get in a screech owl, and the caller says, I have a baby great horned owl. But a baby great horned owl never looks like that. In a short amount of time, they are huge. They are, they look actually bigger than their parents, covered with this yellow fluff. Um, voracious mouse eaters. So yeah, we people do confuse baby screech owls or screech owls with great horned owls, thinking that they are babies. And great horned owls are the owls that hoot at night. Um, you can hear them, I'm sure you've heard them up in the trees hooting, whereas screech owls... Screech owls are much more silent. They have a little bit of a hoot, but it's kind of a trilling hoot. And screech owls don't, another reason why you don't tend to see screech owls out um, as much if you're out and about in the early evening at dusk where you'd see a great horned owl and hear a great horned owl. These screech owls, they tend to go out in the middle of the night because they want to avoid that great horned owl, which would be a predator for them. They would, they would end up being food for a great horned owl. So they tend to come out in the middle of the night when we don't see them, avoiding that guy over there. Great horned owls, you will see them out at dawn and dusk. And even though screech owls don't screech, the barn owl is the one that makes that terrifying screech. And they fly at night and they look white. They're also not usually out at dawn and dusk. This guy comes out earlier, stays out later, because he is the top dog in the night sky. You'll see crows, they call it mobbing, sometimes flying around and around a tree and calling and calling and calling. Well, there's probably a great horned owl minding his own business in there sleeping, and they want to drive him away because um, this is the top predator. A great horned owl a healthy great horned owl in the nighttime sky really has no predators except great, another great horned owl or man. We do get a lot of them in because they're hit by cars, caught in barbed wire fences, and unfortunately there are still some people out there who use rodenticides. Just in Los Osos recently, I don't know if you saw in the paper, there was an article, one of the resident owls at Sweet Springs Preserve was found that it was killed from rodenticide poisoning and we got in the one of the babies and it lived but we did have to treat it so rodenticides are always a bad thing and these guys if you leave them alone they'll do their job a um a baby baby great horned owls baby barn owls each baby will eat five and six mice a night so these parents during baby season all they do is back and forth feed them all night long so they they are quite good hunters i was mentioning before the camouflaging of these guys and if you turn them around and look at them and you think about one of these birds being up in an oak tree or a pine tree they really look like bark i mean they almost disappear her with size also helps her completely disappear but they're incredibly well camouflaged at night um, so the out the great horned owl really gives himself away hooting but she's pretty quiet and stealthy out there. Anything to add, Kathy? Well, if you look at their talons, they're very, very strong. A great horned owl has actually been known to eat a skunk, a porcupine. They've found over 240 species of prey animals that these guys will go after. So, yeah. And skunk smell does not bother them. No, it doesn't. At all. <laughs> 
we wanted you all to see the comparison of these three owls together so you can get a really good idea of the different sizes and the different looks that they all have. We have the long-eared owl, the western screech owl, and the great horned owl here being the biggest, biggest and smallest, or one of the smallest. And we want to say thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, my name is Melinda Alvarado. I'm a wildlife educator with Pacific Wildlife Care. One day, many years ago, a call came into the hotline about a bat. I was unnerved because I thought they were all disgusting, disease-ridden animals. This was the beginning of a path of no return for me. I became intrigued and possessed by, by them. This is Radar. She's a big brown bat. She came to me almost eight years ago from a wildlife center in San Diego. She was brought into them because she had a broken wing. The wing healed, but it healed in a position that's frozen and she doesn't have full range of motion so she can't fly. This happens frequently when pups are learning to fly. They're clumsy, just like we are when we're learning to walk. Usually what happens when they first are out flying, they'll slam into something that they think would be a good place to rest. And they have to learn how to turn and, and hang upside down by their feet. They have to learn to catch insects on the wing. They have to learn to get a drink of water by skimming the surface of, of water. Perhaps this is what happened to Radar when she, when she got her injury. She may have been just out on her maiden flight and, and ran into something and broke her wing. Or she may have been caught by a dog or cat. We really don't know what happened. Some of the interesting things that I've learned about bats over the years is that they can live 20, 30, 40 years. Females rarely leave their family unit. Fish and Wildlife estimates that bats consume 1,500 dump truckloads of insects every night from spring until fall. If, our, if we lose our bats, we will be quickly overrun by insects. No other animal eats more night flying insects in it than bats. Bat pups are about one third their mother's body weight. If we had to bear something like that, a 150 pound woman would have a 50 pound baby. Bat, mother bats that are lactating or pregnant, they will eat their entire body weight in insects every night. If, again, if I go back to the 150 pound woman, that woman would eat 150 pounds of potatoes every single night. They're pretty amazing with things that they eat. Bats are gentle and shy. They do not get stuck in our hair unless we, in our fear and um, nervous, nervousness, are flailing our arms around. Then we knock them into, their, into our hair. So what do you do when you find a grounded bat? Without touching it with your bare hands, gently scoop it into a box and call your local wildlife center. In San Luis Obispo, you'll find my phone number on the recording. Give me a call or a text is better and we'll figure out how to take care of the bat. I am extremely appreciative of Pacific Wildlife Care for all the work and all of the thousands of animals that have, have been cared for by them over the years. I'm proud to be a part of the passionate team of people that work here and, and also all of the different jobs and things that Pacific Wildlife Care has from board members to um, center, center staff, the volunteers, the transporters, the rescuers, members and supporters. Without everyone working together, we wouldn't be able to do what we do for wildlife. And lastly, I want to say bats rule. Hi, I'm Brooke Siegel, and this is William Snakespear. William Snakespear is a Pacific gopher snake and he is one of our non-releasable wildlife ambassadors here at Pacific Wildlife Care. The reason why William Snakespear is not releasable is because he was raised by a human and he doesn't have any of his natural instincts to survive in the wild. Gopher snakes, as their name suggests, they eat gophers, they eat rodents like rats and mice, but they'll also eat lizards and a bird and some eggs. William is kind of a more average sized gopher snake. He's about four to five feet long. Uh, the largest gopher snake recorded was around seven feet long. 
and they weigh between two and four pounds. And William Snakespear, he lives at the Pacific Wildlife Clinic. And um, do you have any questions? I do. Yeah? Um, how is he different than a rattlesnake? He's very different than a rattlesnake. Um, one thing is he's non-venomous and he does not have a rattle on his tail. Also, a rattlesnake has more of a diamond-shaped head. William's head is more tapered. And another cool thing about uh, Pacific gold gopher snakes is that they vary in color. Some have as many as uh, 66 stripes on their bodies, um, splotches. Usually the belly is a little more yellow, but William has some splotches along the sides. How often does he eat? William eats about once every two weeks, and he eats between three and four medium mice. And because he eats, um, he needs to shed because he keeps growing. And so what William does is he burrows and then he sheds his skin. They shed about once a month and it's a very um, neat uniform shed. Some of his sheds, they even show the eye holes very neatly done as it peels off of them. So, um he protect himself and what, what would be a predator for William? So predators for William include coyotes, um, birds of prey like hawks and people and um, other snakes. Uh, king snakes do eat other snakes and so um, a snake like William would be good food for them. But what William does to protect himself, um, he kind of hisses, he will draw back, and he'll shake his tail. And that's why people confuse him with rattlesnakes because the rattling of their tail, um, especially if they're against dry leaves, will actually kind of mimic the sound of a rattle on a rattlesnake. But they're completely non-venomous. Um, hissing and then biting and thrashing would be a very last resort. And where do they live? They are um, habitat generalists, and so they live from deserts to conifer forests. They're found um, from the Pacific to the Atlantic, as far north as southern Canada, as far south as Mexico. And what should any child that comes upon any snake anywhere do when they spot a snake? Well, they should definitely not touch it, and nobody should touch a snake if they cannot identify it. And they shouldn't touch any snake because uh, snakes are very scared. They are far more scared of you than you are of it. And so you should probably tell your parents, and you should probably leave it alone. They're very beneficial to have in our ecosystem. They help keep the balance and you know, they're also important in the food chain for other animals. Do they feed at night or during the day? Well, snakes are diurnal, but sometimes it is so hot that it could be dangerous to the snakes to go on the ground to forage because it's so hot, they could burn themselves. So what they do is they wait until it cools off and then toward the evening when it's cool enough, they go about and forage. So they're mostly diurnal, but sometimes they might stay up late if they couldn't get a meal in during the daytime. Do you happen to know what um, some of the staff at PwC wanted to name that snake when we got it as an educational ambassador? Oh yes, we had sort of a, a naming contest and one of the names was Justin Timber Snake. And um, not very many of the volunteers who are more literary, they didn't really like that one. They liked the option William Snakespear. And so William Snakespear, it won. And I think it suits his personality a lot more than Justin Timbersnake. Any other questions?
Well, thank you so much for viewing this presentation.